Theistic Evolution Critique, Bringing Home the Bacon. We've been studying the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Um, and uh, it's basically looking at theistic evolution itself. Now, to set the stage, as we've done before, um, there are several different theories you can have. Um, uh, you can have a young life creationism. Um, var varieties of that include young earth and young universe creationism. Um, old earth creationism, which is more precisely old life because old earth with young life is still young life creationism, really. Um, you can have theistic evolution, but which is ID friendly. And what that means is that as yes, things evolve gradually, but God stepped in and did stuff, and you can tell by looking at it. Then there is what I would call non-ID theistic evolution, uh, theistic evolution, and that is theistic evolution where everything evolved in a supposedly natural way, and maybe God stepped in, maybe he didn't, but you really can't tell by looking. Um, not even statistically, if you're going to be very precise about it. And then, of course, you can go all the way to atheistic evolution. Um, what the book is talking about is not really atheistic evolution, although obviously that will uh, enter into the discussion. What it's really talking about is theistic evolution that is too embarrassed to say that God could ever be detected. And that's really what the book is aiming at. This chapter is by Colin Reeves, and it's in the section on philosophical critique. Um, and it, the full title of the uh, chapter is Bring Home, Bringing Home the Bacon, the Interaction of Science and Scripture Today. Now, the summary starts out, recent years have seen several examples where apparent scientific truth has been used to cast doubt on traditional biblical doctrines. Principally, this has concerned the reinterpretation of the early chapters of Genesis in order to question the need for historical Adam and for a fall that entailed physical death. I want you to notice that whenever the conflict uh, happens, it usually starts with Genesis. Um, this chapter addresses not so much the biblical evidence for these doctrines, which has been forcefully defended elsewhere. We're, we'll get to that. Uh, but the underlying methodology of those who question them. Their approach, those who question them, can be traced back to Francis Bacon's work of the early 17th century, which argued that God has spoken in two books where the book of nature, for which today read science, is the key to interpreting the Bible. It is commonly asserted that, contrary to writers such as Richard Dawkins, there is no conflict between science and scripture. These two books are complementary and not opposed to each other. And by the way, I would agree with that statement depending on how you define science. In this chapter, we shall see that, like Bacon, those who promote this view most assiduously do not, in fact, so regard the interaction between science and the Bible. They're fooling themselves. Science, that is, science assumed to be an autonomous source of truth, um, and I would emphasize assumed to be because it's not really, in practice always trumps scripture. This has consequences not only for a particular doctrines such as the fall or the atonement, but for a whole way of doing theology. The Bible is no longer inerrant, authoritative, sufficient, or even perpiscuous, clear. The scientific approach to biblical interpretation really follows closely the lines of classical liberalism. Thus, there is indeed a conflict between science and scripture, a conflict that is dangerous not only for theology, but also for true science itself. Notice that he's making a distinction between the science in quotes and true science. And that is the end of the summary, which is kind of like an abstract. Okay, the introduction to this. Advocates of theistic evolution are increasingly urging us to modify or even abandon historical biblical doctrines. That Adam and Eve were the ancestors of the whole human race, that the fall was an event in space-time history that introduced sin and death to the world, that Christ died as a substitutionary atonement for the sins of his people. All these need revision. 
Atheists have long contended that this logically follows from a belief in evolution. One atheist argues as follows. Evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' early life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. For too long, the church has refused to face up to this argument, preferring to pretend that we can accept the claims of evolution and still adhere to historical Christianity. But recent books such as those by Francis Collins and Dennis Alexander have raised important issues for the Christian church, as has the advent of the Biologos website. Several authors have pointed out that theistic evolution has serious implications for the integrity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many who disagree with adherents of theistic evolution may previously have supposed in all charity that theistic evolutionists have not thought through these implications, especially the soteriological ones, but supporters of theistic evolution are starting to break cover. Joseph Bankard, for example, argues, with commendable honesty, on the Biologos website that substitutionary atonement does not fit well with the theory of evolution. By the way, it's up there. You can read it, and it's uh, quite a fascinating read. He explains, if evolution is true, then the universe is very old, humans evolved from primates, and the fall is not a historical event. Whenever you see the black ellipses, that's theirs. Whenever you see the green ones, those are mine. However, if denying the historical fall calls into question the doctrine of original sin, then it also calls into question the role of the cross of Christ within substitutionary atonement. If Jesus didn't die in order to come, overcome humanity's original sin, then why did Jesus die? What is Jesus, the second Adam, attempting to restore with the cross, if not the sin of the first Adam? Substitutionary atonement sees original sin as a major reason for Christ's death, but macroevolution calls the fall and the doctrine of original sin into question. Thus, evolution poses a significant challenge to substitutionary atonement. Part two of Bankard's article explains that, in his alternative view of the cross, Christ's death was not part of God's divine plan. Uh, and I forgot to put the emphasis back in. Uh, could anyone more blatantly contradict Acts 2.23? But this follows from the theistic evolution approach to scripture, a typical example of which is articulated by Alexander in an article on the Faraday Institute website, which is the British counterpart to uh, the Biologos website. The common view today, the stock thesis of the new e atheist, is that science and religion are intrinsically in conflict. In fact, science is one. This is not new, of course. As T.H. Huxley put it, whenever science and orthodoxy have been fairly opposed, the latter has been forced to retire from the lists, bleeding and crushed, if not annihilated. Alexander rejects the conflict thesis, as well as the ideas of the late Stephen Jay Gould, who regarded science and religion as non-overlapping magisteria. On balance, Alexander prefers what is generally called a complementary or two books model, one popular with many theistic evolution writers. Francis Bacon in the two books. David Tyler has helpfully surveyed the two books model of scientific and theological interaction in medi medieval Catholicism. So Bacon comes from a rich history. Within Protestantism, it received greater development, notably by Francis Bacon, and here's a quote from Bacon. For our Savior saith you err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, laying before us two books or volumes to study, if we will be secured from error. First the scriptures revealing the will of God, and then the creatures expressing his power, whereof the latter is a key unto the former. Notice that science interprets scripture. Bacon's contention was that the traditional philosophy exemplified by artist Aristotle had mistakenly proceeded from basic axioms to deduce necessary consequences about the world. And frankly, I would agree with him in part about that. Um, in contrast, he strongly urged an inductive methodology proceeding from the facts about the natural world in order to discover generalized descriptions or laws. His later Novum Organum Centarium, patterned on Aristotle's organon, but 
offering a radically different direction, developed his ideas more extensively. In the earlier work, he sums up as follows. To conclude, therefore, let no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works, divinity or philosophy, but rather let men endeavor an endless progress or proficience in both. Only let men beware that they do not unwisely mingle or confound these learnings together. You know, if you twist that in a certain way, you can get Leonard Brand's uh, uh, thesis. This quotation significantly was used by Darwin in The Origin of Species. Already we see that Bacon's idea of the interaction of science and scriptures leans towards an autonomous model that is autonomous for science. Moody, Moody Pryor's seminal article argued that Bacon believed that nothing can be known except in a certain way, and this way entailed separating completely the realms of religion and of natural knowledge. In which case, does natural knowledge interpret religion? Well, let's skip that. These leanings must not be mingled together. Learnings must not be mingled together. Indeed, Bacon goes further. Science is the key to scripture, certainly not the reverse, as in the quote we read. As Pryor showed, when Bacon did write on specific biblical passages, for example, the fall and Cain and Abel, he interpreted them in terms of his favorite notions. One important notion was Bacon's chronic optimism that science is a pathway to cumulative knowledge and progressive enlightenment. Um, positively, this advanced philanth philanthropy and humanitarian action, but negatively, it produced the concept of the science scientist as Superman. Uh, Bacon assumed that re religion is merely a means of limiting the abuse of the power that the scientist gains. This is a very condensed survey, but some brief comments are in order. Bacon's main target was Aristotelian thought, which had stifled scientific inquiry by relying on speculative metaphysics rather than empirical data. Bacon argued that we should have our minds washed clean from opinions, fat chance of that happening, and let the facts speak for themselves. This empirical approach was a factor in the growth of science in the 17th century. And it was. But it was not the only factor. For example, Peter Harrison stresses the particular role played by the reformer's approach to biblical interpretation. Whereas the accounts of creation in the book of Genesis had previously, that is in the medieval Catholic Church, following origin, by the way, um, had previously provided scope for the imaginations of exegetes given to allegory, now the significance of these stories was seen to lie in their literal truth as, de as depicting past events. Actually, the primary impulse for scientific investigations was not Baconian empiricism, although that was a factor, but a conviction that scientific investigation was a religious duty so that legitimate meanings of the book of nature were sought in the purposes for which God had designed its living continents. Indeed, what became known as physiotheology, physical theology, which Harrison summarizes as a detailed elaboration of the design argument, was seen as the key to the interpretation of the book of nature. Of this teolo teleological approach to be developed most clearly by Robert Boyle and John Ray, uh, Boyle of Boyle's Law, uh, Bacon was rather scornful. As noted above, he would reverse the roles of Key and Locke. In modern parlance, Harrison's analysis makes a compelling case that science was founded on the presupposition of intelligent design. And in fact, it was founded on a creationist version of intelligent design, interestingly enough. Bacon did assert that the scientific enterprise should be carried out to God's glory and mankind's benefit, but his concept of how science works has serious flaws. Moreover, its application as a philosophical paradigm to other spheres has dire consequences for theology in particular. In a critique of relevance to the theistic evolution position, Nancy Piercy argues that it has led to a two-story view of the relationship between scripture and the world around us. And if you really want to know that, read her book. It's Fascinating read. A Total Truth. We reviewed that a long, long, long time ago. Um, finally, we should not miss the irony underlying the two books approach. How do we truly know that a creation 
that creation is a book of God's works, apart from the fact that the scriptures tell us so. If the Bible is not what it declares itself to be, the infallible and inerrant word of God, why should we expect a second book at all? Complementarity. In his Faraday Institute article, Alexander, one of our theistic evolutions, uh, evolutionists, concludes that the two realms are not autonomous but complementary. Two accounts may be given of some physical phenomenon without being in conflict. Both can be true if they focus on dis different aspects or operate at different levels. This modified Baconian view is widespread within the organization Christians in Science as evidenced by frequent comments in their newsletters and articles in the jur journal Science and Christian Belief. A generation ago, Gareth Jones stated the view as follows. Biblical knowledge and scientific knowledge represent different levels of appreciating reality. At best, these two levels are complementary. At the worst, they may be contradictory. Ooh. And if they are, wh which one do you choose? This is echoed more recently by Melvin Tinker, who said much the same thing. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip his quote. Thus, Derek Burke contends that Genesis 1 is a why account, but not a how account. So it need not be seen as historical. Uh, exactly how that works is interesting. This is an example of false dichotomy. Insisting that because something is X, it is therefore not Y, without establishing that X and Y are mutually exclusive. That's false dichotomy. That the Bible is not a scientific book, is a textbook, is a truism, but prima facie, Early Genesis does appear to be a record of literal historical events. And according to Harrison, that presumption, rather than Baconian autonomy, was the foundation on which science began in the 17th century. The complementary view leads to different conclusions from those of the early scientists. For example, Tinker quotes the scientist Donald McKay. It is impossible for a scientific discovery given by God to contradict a word given by God. If, therefore, a scientific discovery, as distinct from a scientific speculation, contradicts what we have believed by the Bible, it is not a question of error in God's word, but error in our way of interpreting it. Yes, true, but this begs the question. What is in dispute is precisely whether Darwinism is a scientific discovery given by God rather than a projection onto science of an anti-theistic naturalism. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to it. And at least parts of the answer, part of the answer must consider its implications for Christian doctrine. In biblical hermeneutics, that is principles of interpretation, we sometimes encounter the language of appearances, such as in Psalm 19's description of the sun's progress through the sky. As Calvin phrased it, there is an accommodation of biblical language to the observation of the reader. Thus, he says, Genesis 1 calls the moon a great light, although it is smaller than the planets. But certainly it doesn't create more light. Uh, or it does create more light. The Regardless, the questions surrounding Darwinism go beyond such considerations in that they affect a whole theological tradition. Granted, tradition is not an autonomous authority either, but as J.I. Packer argues, it is not unimportant. I'm going to skip his argument. As Alexander's book demonstrates, theistic evolution has a serious problem in attempting to reconcile Darwinism with classical reform doctrines concerning the nature of mankind and the fall, and the doctrine of scripture of scripture that it presupposes is the key. A question of priority. Alexander believed that those who think Genesis has evidence of relevance to science exemplify a model that presents religious convictions as if they were science, seeking to fuse scientific and religious knowledge by assigning priority to religious beliefs. He is correct about the need to prioritize, although he clearly thinks that science, at least his idea of science, ranks higher than religious convictions. Herein lies the fundamental problem with the complementarian position. A model that creationists would accept was outlined 40 years ago by Francis Schaeffer. Agreed, Schaeffer said, the Bible is not a scientific textbook, but it does create boundaries for our scientific theories. Within the circle so defined, science is free to consider questions that scripture does not deal with directly. Under God's common grace, truth about the world can be found by believer and unbeliever alike, provided that they operate within the circle. 
But what if our interpretation of the Bible seems at variance with the scientific discovery, according to John Frame? If, after reflection, I determined that my original interpretation of Scripture was correct, and that still conflicts with the apparent results of science, then I must follow Scripture. Creationists do not have all the answers, but they agree with Frame. If a fundamental Christian doctrine is negated by a scientific hypothesis, we should consider alternative hypotheses. It is particularly ironic that an alternative Darwinism exists today in the work of the intelligent design movement. Ideas essentially consistent with biblical doctrine, especially in some forms, and is supported by many scientists and theologians whose views cannot be lightly dismissed. Yet proponents of theistic evolution regularly do so, either ignoring ID together or treating it with lofty disdain. In this regard, R.J. Berry's review of Norman Nevin's book is a classic of his genre. Even less intemperate theistic evolution proponents continue to privilege modern science above the Bible. Tinker, for instance, states that the facts of science is distinct from speculation, and who makes that distinction, um, provides us with a check or, correlate, or corrective to ensure that we are looking at the passage from the right angle. He asked the question there, an aroma of bacon? And still the question is begged for how do we distinguish facts from speculation? Elsewhere, Tinker appears to suggest that the criteria for a fact is its acceptance by the international scientific community. Whoa. This can surely not be the definitive for the Christian believer. After all, it is not unknown for the international scientific community to be wrong. Furthermore, while science is seen as a corrective for biblical her hermeneutics, the notion that scripture might correct our scientific notions is never entertained for a moment, in spite of the fact that it's been demonstrated to correct uh, the standard historical narrative. Um, Graham Finley and Stephen Pattermore want us to adopt a stance of humility toward our current understanding of scripture. Well, we're not infallible and shouldn't confuse what scripture te teaches with what we think it teaches. But we do have two millennia of Christian theology to inform us. I think that's... Moreover, there is no suggestion of an equivalent stance of humility towards our current understanding of science. This is particularly strange, this is especially strange in the light of hu history, which contains many examples of scientific facts on the consensus criterion that turned out to be incorrect. The self-correcting potential of science may be raised here, but the basis for that argument is precisely the provisional status of scientific theories. Francis Collins and Dennis Alexander clearly take this position. Christian theology is presumed to be corrigible in a way that science is not. Scripture, far from being complementary, actually becomes subordinate to science. Barry, whose article appears to have served as a rehearsal for parts of Alexander's book, is actually horrified at Frame's suggestion that Scripture might serve to modify scientific ideas. In contrast, Vern Polythress affirms this as a natural part of Christian reflection on Scripture. Biblical interpretation affects science at the very least by leading us to reassess whether all the conclusions drawn from a scientific theory are warranted, or in some cases to ask whether the theory as a whole is suspect. Bible can talk to science. In summary, there is sufficient evidence that theistic evolution is only too happy to prioritize, provided science has a priority. Modifying Alexander's formula, we might conclude that theistic evolution fuses scientific and religious knowledge by assuming priority to scientific fact, beliefs. The na nature of the interaction between science and scripture is such that the complementary model is unstable. The noetic effect of the fall. While biblical interpretation may occasionally need revision, and such revision may perhaps be suggested by scientific discoveries, Anyone who claims to stand on the same ground as the reformers should be wary of overconfidence in our rational facilities. Um, Packer gives a, a comment on that. There's another, uh, it's a quote um, that we'll omit. And uh, here's a, uh, another quote that's representative of the same thing. Herman Bavink concurs that Christianity seeks to redeem human beings from all sin, from errors of the mind, as well as the impurity of the heart. Scripture, in the nature of the case, cannot subject itself to the criticism of human beings, but must subject them to its criticism. 
These quotations focus on the noetic effect of sin, its effect on the intellect. The fall was a radical and comprehensive transformation of human nature. Mankind's rebellion against God touches every facility, including our minds. Skipping over a little, prior to the Reformation, this doctrine was somewhat attenuated. Aquinas, for example, saw the fall as producing a wound of, uh, of ignorance to the mind. But Calvin, in particular, following Augustine, saw the effects as more serious than mere ignorance. Mankind is not merely deprived, but depraved. And uh, then it cites uh, Abraham Coupier and Cornelius Van Til. And if you're wondering, because we're going to get to it, Cornelius is the father of Howard Van Til that we'll discuss later. For Cooper and, forgive my Dutch, in science there are two sorts of thinking and thinkers. Abnormalists assume that the present conditions of the cosmos is different from what it was in the beginning. Normalists, on the other hand, disregard the Bible's evidence and presuppose that everything results from an unbroken naturalistic change, chain of cause and effect. Moreover, these two schools are locked in deadly combat. combat. Shades of Second uh, Peter 3. So asking, can we believe Genesis today, Lucas, or is the fall credible, Barry, suppose, presupposes that autonomous re human reason has authority to answer these questions and so to judge the scriptures. If fallen man is competent to judge the credibility of the fall, should we be surprised at the answer? Clarity of scripture. Another key doctrine of the Reformation was that the Bible is a per, per, piscu, uh, boy. Per, perspic, perspicuous, there we are, against medieval church doctrine that uh, scripture could only be truly understood through the officially sanctioned church teaching mediated by the clergy, which of course meant that the Reformation could not happen because they weren't part of the officially uh, approved church uh, clergy. Luther insisted on clarity of scripture, that is the clarity of scripture. Hence the importance of translating the Bible into ordinary language as in Tyndale's affirmation that the plowboy with the Bible would know more than the Pope. The reformers did not despise hermeneutics. They knew that some scriptures are hard to understand and provided extensive expository material for the edification of the church. Nor did they denigrate the preaching and teaching offices of the church in favor of private interpretation as became fashionable later with the post-enlightenment individualism. There is a tension inherent in Claritus Scripturae, one helpfully explored by James Callahan and Mary, Larry Pettigrew, but a perspicuity does not mean, uh, pardon me, it does mean that Scripture needs no external source of validation, whether the Roman Church or, laterally, the arbitrary authority of academic elitism arising from higher criticism. Essentially, Perpiscuity emphasizes in the word of Westminster Confession that the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is the scripture itself. This is where theistic evolution diverges from historic reform doctrine. Its exponents frequently state that scripture is authoritative. Perhaps many affirm its inerrancy, but they do not seem to believe it is clear in the sense indicated above. Sadly, as Douglas Kelly points out, liberal exegetes have no problem in seeing Genesis 1 to 3 as intending to be history. Although they dismiss it as primitive, it is evangelicals who doubt its clarity, imposing an external scientific framework that entails a variety of tortured exegetical speculations that I guess you need a special clergy to figure out. Thus, Alexander seeks to make Genesis 1 to 3 cohere with current ideas of human evolution. Adam becomes just one of many Neolithic farmers, and the account of his creation, temptation, and fall is adjusted to fit this framework. Far from being an account of historical events, the narrative is a polemic against ancient Near Eastern, predominantly Babylonian, ideologies. According to Alexander, it is against this background that we must consider the early chapters of Genesis. Similarly, John H. Walton writes... If we accept Genesis 1 as ancient cosmology, then we need to interpret it as ancient cosmology. And we need to read the text as the ancient audience would have heard it. Question begging once more. Why accept the Genesis as ancient cosmology? How do we know what the ancient audience heard? Yet Alexander, Walton, and many others all assume that early Genesis cannot be properly interpreted without the insights gained from ancient Near Eastern texts. 
in uh, our application of those insights, I might add. According to Noel Weeks, however, Genesis is distinguished from much of the Old Testament by its lack of polemic against polytheistic I idolatry. The Pentateuch's concern with idolatry becomes very obvious in Exodus, but assuming equal prominence in Genesis is imposing an interpretation on the text. Moreover, on the basis of Mosaic responsibility for the Pentateuch, and maybe these guys deny that too, we might expect any polemic to focus on Egypt and its gods, not Babylon. In any case, where is the evidence that Israel based its foundational narrative on Near Eastern myths? It is surely equally plausible that the ancient Near Eastern texts are polemic against the true account, being a corrupted version of an oral tradition dating from the scattering at Babel. Finally, even if, a, for the sake of argument, Genesis 1 to 11 is a polemic, it would only gain in force were the, were the events truly historical compared to Babylonian myths. When faced with hermeneutical issues, the proper context for interpreting a particular passage of scripture is scripture itself. What chapters 1 to 3 of Genesis mean cannot be isolated from the larger context of chapter 1 through 11, nor from Genesis as a whole, nor from the Pentateuch, especially Exodus 20, verse 11, and so on. Above all, we cannot safely ignore the New Testament, which gives no hint that the apostles or Jesus himself regarded Genesis as anti-Babylonian polemic. Rather, they treat the early chapters of the Bible as describing historical events, in one case being more important than the Mosaic Law. Ooh. Moreover, events of crucial so soteriological significance. In contrast, Walton, in a revealing radio debate about his second book, The Lost World of Adam and Eve, insists that we cannot possibly interpret Genesis properly from the New Testament. Rather, we start with what the author intended to say. And we can discern this intent today much better than the apostles could, as they were part of a Hellenistic world. I, I suppose that uh, Jesus was part of a Hellenistic world too. What of Tyndale's plowboy in this scenario? Walton allows that the ordinary Christian may understand the general outline, but otherwise must rely, just rely on expert scholarship. And of course, he's the expert. Walton himself called in an expert to help make his case in the lost world of Adam and Eve, apparently feeling unqualified fully to evaluate what the New Testament says about Adam, how unclear it must be. Um, Walton invited New Testament scholar N.T. Wright to add his own thoughts in an excursus in chapter 19. The title of this chapter, Paul's use of Adam, is more interested in the effect of sin on the cosmos than in the effect of sin on humanity and has nothing to say about human origins, is also revealing in the light of Wright's own controversial view on justification. Apparently, the accumulated theology of the last two millennia has promulgated an inadequate and misleading reading of pretty much everything that Paul wrote. So Wright is happy to endorse 21st century science as a hermeneutic for Genesis. From the viewpoint of perspicuity, the theistic evolution approach also raises further problems. Was a true interpretation of Genesis 1 to 11 even possible prior to the discovery of the Enuma Elish and other ancient Near Eastern uh, stories? Did a correct understanding of Adam and Eve and the fall await the advent of Charles Darwin? Even from a practical viewpoint, giving science a final word in this way is dubious. When Darwinism is supplanted by something else, we will need to adjust our theology again. In, this, in the 19th century, the great James Clerk Maxwell, who, uh, Maxwell's laws and the uh, speed of light and so forth, uh, pointed out the folly of this approach, gently chiding Bishop Ellicott, who was overexcited by another piece of speculative science. The rate of change of scientific hypothesis, this is Maxwell speaking, is naturally much more rapid than that of biblical interpretations. So if an interpretation is founded on such a hypothesis, it may help to keep the hypothesis above ground long after it ought to, be buried, ought to have been buried and forgotten. Rather more caustically, the historian and theologian Carl Truman recently observed, how come some people with little or no scientific training and who spend their lives telling us how difficult it is to understand messy written texts, texts designed to <clears throat> communicate in a relatively direct fashion, 
seem to think that scientific data is univocal, unequivocal, and perspicuous on evolution. This echoes the view of Martin Lloyd-Jones over 50 years ago on the relationship of science to scripture. He wrote, if you study the history of science, you will have much less respect for its supposed supreme authority than you had when you began. Without arguing in detail about scientific matters, it is not only lacking in faith and unscriptural, but it is ignorant to accord science, modern knowledge, or learning an authority which they really do not possess. Since the Bible of theistic evolution is obscure, so is its theology, descending into incoherence when it attempts to reconstruct what salvation means. For example, Alexander's article on the purpose of the Incarnation merely states that Christ opens up the way back to, to friendship with God through his sacrifice for sins on the cross. Traditional words, but the content is not. In fact, according to Alexander, physical death is not a penalty for sin, nor is sin inherited. Adam is every man. All people sin. Christ died for the sins of us all. But what does every man mean, and why the cross? If physical death is normal, what did this death accomplish? What did this death accomplish? If friendship is, is friendship an adequate summary of our relationship to God? As was said of the Victorian liberal preacher F.W. Robertson, Dennis Alexander's sociology, soteriology reduces to Christ did something or other, which somehow or other had some connection or other with salvation. Theological liberalism. Early generations saw the denial of scriptural priority as typical of old-style liberal Christianity. Packer described this subjectivist view of scripture as one in which reason and conscience must judge scripture and tradition, refashioning the whole to bring it into line with the accepted philosophy of the time. That's an interesting commentary. That this led to a wholesale re reinterpretation of Genesis in particular is a simple matter of record. Nigel Cameron has documented several examples of this phenomenon in the 19th century. Packard's reasoned answer to liberal methodolo methodology is very relevant. Scripture's authority is A, established by the teaching of Christ concerning the Old Testament, B, confirmed by the teaching of the apostles, and C, recognized in the attitude of the early church. For me, A and B is good enough. Therefore, the Bible does not need to be revised and corrected by reason. Instead, it demands to sit in judgment on reason's dictates. The motivations of proponents of theistic evolution also resemble those of yesteryear's liberals. The liberals wanted people to become Christians, but thought this required the demythology, demythologization of Christianity. Interestingly, in the Old Testament, starting with Genesis. Similarly, Alexander argues that, as Darwinism is undeniable, any reading of scriptures that assumes the historical nature of early Genesis must be revised. Those who maintain the historical view are embarrassing and bring the gospel into disrepute. A recent symposium in the online Nine Marks Journal on the history of liberalism is very relevant to theistic evolution. Al Mohler ob observes that Alexander's preoccupation is precisely where problems begin. The lessons of uh, theological liberalism is clear. Embarrassment is the gateway drug for theological accommodation and denial. In a similar vein, Gregory Will said the, much the same thing. We'll skip that. Again, we have a limited time. This is no misrepresentation. Daniel Harlow, for example, argues explicitly that for Christianity re to remain in intellectually credible and culturally relevant, it must be willing to revise and therefore enrich its formulation of classical doctrines if the, secular, if the secure findings of science call for revision. And Alexander says much the same thing. Moreover, as ni the Nine Marks authors show, historically, the effect of the liberal project was the opposite of its intention. Far from making Christianity more acceptable to the educated, intelligent, and cultured, it provided them with excuses to ignore its claims. Without doubting the sincerity of the liberal theologians, it is clear that their project was disastrous for the church. And the book asks, will theistic evolution fare any better? The Odyssey. Darwinism conflicts radically with orthodox Christian doctrine in relation to the existence of evil. Cameron surveys a good starting point. In his view, rather than a, a, an anti-ancient Near Eastern polemic, 
Genesis 1 through 3 is the great theodicy. Without the goodness of the original world and man's responsibility for its fall, to believe in God's goodness is wholly irrational. As uh, Cooper argued, the, um, the science has to reckon with the truth that the world is abnormal. It is not as God originally created it. Evolutionary thinking must deny this. Yet without the discontinuity of the fall and the subsequent curse, there is a problem that, ironically, non-Christian thinkers understand very well. Here's philosopher David Hall. And this is part of a beautiful quote. You should read the whole quote sometime. The God implied by evolutionary theory is not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is careless, wasteless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. Not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. The whole solution is simple. Jettison God altogether. But theists can't follow suit. So the theologian Christopher Southgate, for example, ponders at length the problems delineated by Hull. Since he accepts Darwinism, Southgate has difficulty finding a solution. Pain, suffering, and death are intrinsic to evolution, so evolution is in need of redemption. But how? After laboring manfully for pages, he settles for the rather underwhelming notion of a pelican heaven, symbolizing the hope that everything will be fine in the end. And then the book outlines attempts similar attempts by Alexander and John Snyder. That would be unfortunate. This question is serious, as Howard Van Til demonstrated very clearly. That's the son of our previously mentioned Cornelius Van Til. For many years, Van Til, a faculty member at Calvin College, yes, that's uh, John Calvin College, espoused a theistic evolutionary position, defending it tirelessly in the journal edited by Alexander, Science and Christian Belief, or its American counterpart, Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. Eventually, however, his reflections on evolution and theodicy led him to renounce belief in a supernatural God altogether. Although, thankfully, many do not take the view to its logical conclusion, Van Til's position demonstrates that theistic evolution is an uneasy compromise and its theodical implications are uh, theodical, I guess, are potentially faith-destroying. Once the Reformed doctrine of Scripture is revised, anything can happen, and probably will. No conflict? What then of the no-conflict thesis? Try as we might to keep the two realms apart, they stubbornly refuse to stay independent. As Gareth Jones acknowledges, there are contradictions, and when the conflict arises, science insists on being top dog. Complementarians will say that this is scientism, not science, and you can make that point. I think it's a valid one. But the commentator Brian Appleyard regards this as a distinction without a difference. Well, it, I, I think that's going a little too far. Science as currently practiced, as what I would call the current scientific consensus, has a profound tendency towards totalitarianism. Science possesses an intrinsically domineering quality. This kind of triumphant scientism is built into all of science. Opposition tends to be subdued and demoralized to the point where we can no longer identify the damage done. If there's another realm, Apple Yard continues, science will attempt to colonize it. Science is not a neutral or innocent commodity, I, I would say a certain kind of science, uh, which can be employed as a convenience. Rather, it is spiritually corrosive. It cannot really coexist with anything. Scientists inevitably take on the mantle of the wizards, sorcerers, and witch doctors. Now, Richard Dawkins is perhaps the most famous exemplar of this attitude, but he is not alone. Consider comments from the American physicist Bob Park. Science is, in fact, the only way of knowing. Anything else is just religion, which is all about authority. And the British neuroscientist Sir Colin Blakemore, likewise, which we will not read. In contrast, the Christian scientist Maxwell, that's James Clerk Maxwell, was an object lesson in modesty and candor. In discussing the nature and limits of scientific hypotheses, he warned that we see the phenomenon only through a medium and are liable to blindness to facts and rashness in assumption and are thus prone to be being carried beyond the truth. Um, and then uh, he cites Appleyard and Richard Weaver, and Richard Weaver says... We hear smooth words to the effect that there is no real conflict between Darwinian science and religion. There is no real conflict anywhere when one side gives up. 
The question still at issue is whether the facts and logic dictate so complete a surrender as has been urged on one party. Can we really entertain the thesis of no conflict between science and religion? There's a sense in which the thesis may be granted, uh, and I would do that, but its reflex universal assertion is clearly inadequate. It really depends on how these concepts are designed, especially science. Does complementarity save the day? Appleyard is skeptical. Um, so no real conflict? Hmm. Can scientists keep science uh, and scientism apart? Is science as understood by Ray and Newton, Faraday and Maxwell really the same animal as the science of Darwin's Park and Blakemore? And I would say no. Two ways. Appleyard's arguments are weighty, yet they fail to get to the root of the problem. He describes the science that has become too big for its boots, but he can see only in its continuation only its continuation into the chaos and tyranny of absolute relativism. This oxymoron is absolute relativism, okay, um, is not explicitly his, but it gets close to the sense of desperation in what he describes. For Appleyard, modern scientists conceive of science as self-attesting, autonomous, remorseless, untrammeled by notions of morality or transcendence. The only limits are those of feasibility. Science certainly needs no ties to any ancient book. How did science advance? how did scientific advance, the roots of which grew in Christian soil, arrive at a place where it threatens to destroy the human condition, largely because it has forgotten those roots. Christian Burkett, a Christian historian of science, agrees. We are still trying to build the Tower of Babel. Instead of seeing science as the noble pursuit that it is, we try to make it our means to becoming gods ourselves. As strenuously as we may affirm the complementary nature of science and Christian doctrine, there is ample empirical evidence that it doesn't really work. A colleague of mine used to have a slogan on his office door. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Precisely, while some theistic scientists proclaim the gospel of complementarian orthodoxy, their bolder colleagues are tearing up the script. And it is a very hard position to maintain because there are points of conflict. Today's science has, in practice, become an autonomous source of knowledge. Even if it doesn't actually rule out God a priori, it assumes that it can apply rationalistic thinking to interpret his revealed word and thus find a God that is suitably subservient to the higher knowledge of science. As Schaefer says, there is no final conflict between science and scripture. But a science that refuses to recognize that it is dealing with the fallen world cannot fail to be in conflict. How then should Christians relate to science? A recent book on this topic by Vern Polythris is helpful. His approach is to start with God. After all, he says scientists, despite their denials, really do presuppose God, as otherwise the whole concept of scientific law has no basis. His book is an outworking of the principle that the Bible is what it claims to be with an authority above that of uninspired natural reason. It should also be affirmed, of course, that human interpretations of what the Bible means for science are not infallible. We might debate some of the particular conclusions that Polyphilus reaches, but there is no issue with his methodology. The theistic evolution approach, on the other hand, and despite its ostensible concern for complementarity, really starts from science. In practice, it brings home Bacon's view, quoted at the outset, that science is the key to the Bible, opening our understanding to conceive of the true sense of the scriptures by the general notions of reason. John Calvin believed the relationship was quite different. In a famous passage, he likened scriptures to spectacles that correct our defective sight so that in considering the works of God, we should be confined within due bounds by listening to the word and not exult in our own vanity. Bacon wrote another book, The New Atlantis. This describes the utopian ki kingdom of Ben Salem, whose pre preeminent organ of state is Solomon's House, a society of scientists run by a cast of fellows, complete with 12 merchants of light and 24 others carrying out a structured scientific program. Ben Salem had converted to Christianity following a strange supernatural event. The preaching of the gospel is absent. And uh, it's an interesting story. If you're interested in more, read the book. Um, Rupert Sheldrake provides a similar tongue-in-cheek analysis. 
Scientists constitute a priesthood superior to the priesthoods of religions, standing in the vanguard of human progress, leading human entity onward and upward to a better and brighter world. If you know Sheldrake, you know he doesn't actually believe that. It's a tongue-in-cheek. This is where today's disciples of Bacon have arrived. We now have a Bible that has lost its authority. It's marked by obscurity rather than clarity, and it's certainly insufficient for a true understanding of the world. From these methodological flaws spring the other theological problems arising from theistic evolution. Furthermore, in autonomous science, sitting over scripture actually does, ends up destroying its own foundations, which ultimately derive from God's revelation in scripture as to his own character and the na nature of his creation. Science arose because the reformers and their heirs rejected the primacy of a figurative allegorical hermeneutic for scripture. But the theistic evolution approach to Genesis would turn the clock back in the name of science. On the other hand, by operating within Schaeffer's circle, science would be restored to its proper place as a revelation of God's glory and an instrument for the good of humanity. Thoughtful secular commentators like Appleyard are deeply pessimistic, expecting only doom and disaster, but they do not know God, nor the truth of his word, nor the power of his spirit, who can release science from its Babylonian captivity. Now, that's the end of that chapter. Uh, skipped a few uh, paragraphs, as you notice. Um, my own personal take on this is that Colin Reeves argues that a model championed by Francis Bacon allows scripture to be interpreted by and eventually subjected to science. Other models of science used by other, more notable, by the way, scientists, allowed scripture to be more authoritative. I just read uh, Isaac Newton, for example. Reeves argues that theistic evolutionists follow Bacon. Hence the title of his chapter, and of course is arguing that we should not. The arguments are fairly subtle at first, but they can lead to widely divergent conclusions. And yet virtually everyone agrees on the two books, books approach. Even me. Uh, just... Uh, the most important point in solving this problem is the recognition that science is not univocal. There is science, and there is science. The current scientific consensus cannot be interpreted as adhering to the ideals of science. There are sociological pressures, there are anti-theological pressures, and those pressures, by the way, do not start with Darwin. They start at least, or at least are present, with Lyell. Maybe they started before Lyell. To put it bluntly, it is pointless to try to harmonize Moses with a theory whose point, according to Charles Lyell, was to free the science from Moses. The only result can be that Moses will be interpreted by anti-Moses, which will result in a nonsense interpretation. That's why it doesn't fit. If Lyell were to be shown to be sound, Moses might be effectively dead. But if Lyell is not sound, and all you have to do is look at Bretz and Eger to realize how unsound Lyell is, Christians have no reason to reinterpret Moses using Lyell. Darwin is dependent on Lyell, and therefore I think Christians should not use Darwin as normative. Intelligent design advocates should certainly be skeptical about Darwin, as they are appropriately in this book. In my opinion, they should carry their skepticism one step further and be skeptical about Lyell as well. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comments? Ariel? This is a very good and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, what uh, it has brought to light in my thinking is uh, how persistent theologians have been in uh, yielding to science. Uh, Toulmin uh, Philosopher at the University of Chicago pointed out how repeatedly uh, 
priority has been given to science and science that, that has, because of changes in science, that priority has been rejected. He gives two major examples. Uh, one is Aristotelianism, why they have the, um, during scholasticism, Aristotle was the authority and <clears throat> that was it. And the uh, uh, Bible was secondary to Aristotle. And, uh, the Bible didn't exist for Aristotle personally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, he talks about also uh, the Newtonian uh, uh, mechanics that had to be given up in the light of uh, modern advances. And uh, why do theologians keep yielding to science? Uh, when uh, uh, science uh, has proved itself to be wrong and major philosophical views uh, have had to be given up uh, because these theologians gave in to science. And uh, it... it, it um, it challenges your thinking a little bit that theologians would destroy themselves so often. Uh, it's not normal human nature to a certain extent, but uh, they're working themselves into annihilation uh, as they keep yielding to science. Uh, and what's worse is they have the, the, the previous uh, generation of liberals as an example, and they still are missing that. Uh, they still seem to exist uh, as they yield more and more to science, uh, at least the liberal theologians, as, as they yield more to science. And uh, I presume that is because uh, most people are unwilling to give up the idea that there isn't a God, uh, that there is a God, and so on, and that uh, most people have the feeling that there's something to, must be something to our existence, and so on, and the factors tell us, hey, this could all happen by itself, and so on. I presume those factors are what, what keeps theology going, but uh, uh, certainly if you keep yielding to science, uh, you're going to destroy theology. Comment over here. It'll come on in a minute. What I have uh, wondered about in these discussions for a long time is uh, it is assumed that if you speak philosophically, you must be closest to the truth. And that's a very safe statement because there's no way of evaluating it. So a philosophical statement... To, takes precedence and it carries with it the assumption that the outcome of science can reveal what preceded the testing and evaluation when in fact if you're hard nosed the only thing that's real is the outcome you've just measured Well, I, I would be cautious with that last statement because I think there are things that are real that that science has difficulty measuring. Oh, that wasn't my intent at all. Yeah. I'm just saying actually the opposite. Yeah. Uh, having a, a, result, a scientific result is assumed in this discussion to not only be testable and verifiable, but also to reflect on what preceded, which is not testable yeah. and cannot be used the tools of science to do. So I think uh, when we get into this and we really let, us t let, let it take us, uh, 
and I'm not commenting on the discussions we have here when I say this, but it's it's honoring the dog who chases his tail. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the lessons of I, I think of the Middle East, Middle Ages was that was that you can't derive all of these things from pers- first principles. That you need to have some observations, or otherwise you will go horribly astray. You, you, all you have to do is think about the uh, quintessence, the five substances, you know, which corresponds to the five mathematical, the geometrical shapes. Yeah, that's mathematical. Um, and how nowadays our our uh, table of the elements is so much more messy, and our table of the uh, fundamental particles is even messier in some ways. We have no clue. I mean, at one point we had kind of some vague idea of how uh, how the elements worked. Um, but uh, when you look at the standard model, why the bottom quark has the weight it does, we we're totally clueless on. You missed a further step backwards. That's going from particles to quantum mechanics, which, of course, yes. quantum, me- quantum mechanics just reveals truth, period. <laughs> Comment here. Go ahead. I sometimes uh, wonder, assuming the Bible is true, which nominally we do assume in an Adventist institution, although that is becoming more questionable by the moment, but just assuming that it is, and Sister White talks about spending eternity learning things. One wonders what science will be like in eternity. It, it is will it rely question. totally on experimentation, journals, peer remove, peer re, peer reviews, or is it going to be more like pre med? where you sit and learn things because people tell you what is true. Only rather than people, it'll be God. Well, one thing is that it'll be a little safer that way because you won't have as many people trying to fool you into believing their systems. I think that science uh, without a devil there will be much more fun. And by the way, I should say something else. Uh, you mentioned Adventism and, and uh, its struggles. Trust me, Christianity in general has those exact same struggles. Uh, look at Calvin College. Fundamentalist. They got Howard Van Til. I was um, contemplating the relationship between knowledge and science and um, science, in many respects, seems to the scientific. Uh, some of the scientific, um, the mindset of some uh, scientists or scientific community seems to be that you can't have knowledge without science. And is that true? Is it is it possible to have true knowledge without any what we would consider to be science? Uh, well, again, it depends on how you define science. Um, there are no peer-reviewed journals in uh, um, AD 5 or whatever it was, or C- BC 5. Um, and Joseph didn't know exactly how uh, sperm and eggs happened to combine chromosomes. It, the, uh, the concept of chromosome would have been totally foreign to him, probably. 
But he did know that if he got pregnant, there was a guy involved. <laughs> and beyond, e, e, to bigger questions too, origins. It, it, can you know something about your origin without having science say something to you about that? Well, the world is historical. And although there are different takes on various stories, um, some of which are either ignorant or intentionally oblivious or unintentionally oblivious to some facts, um, it is still something that is an actual truth. And you know, our, my best evidence for that is, you know, video cameras that have taken out a lot of narratives and put them in a more realistic way. Um, body cameras on policemen have changed the interaction of police with various communities. Because all of a sudden, you can't just say, well, he did this to me, and the police say, no, I didn't. And, well, let's go back to the evidence. Um, and so the world is fundamentally historical. It does matter what happens, and there is a truth, and we can approximate it to a certain degree. Okay. Now, the next question is, is that history ruled by science absolutely? 99.9 something percent of the time, or chaotically. I think we've got some pretty good evidence that it's not chaotic. Scientific laboratories are testimonies to that. You teach students by having them actually push balls off of tables and watch what happens, and maybe photograph them on the way down. And if you're really doing well, you do a strobe light. You calibrate the strobe light, and you can actually see the parabola that's going as it's coming down. And the reason for doing scientific laboratories, I mean, the theory can be taught quite easily. What scientists have to understand is that that theory actually works. And that's what the laboratory is really for. Um, but the laboratory, a plastic frog with plastic organs doesn't do the same thing as actually seeing it for real. Um, one can debate the, you know, the uh, uh, ethical implications of that, but there is a sense in which science actually does things by being by not putting its thumb on the scale and showing that the scale still works. On the other hand, every once in a while there are things that happen, and sometimes they happen not only in a, let's say, not a scientifically not obvious way, but at the same time in a theologically obvious way. When you have that, you have a miracle. And it's important for us to, I think, uh, in our philosophy, to, be, to allow for that to happen. And of course, there are people who are very uncomfortable with that idea because that means that um, everything doesn't proceed exactly the same way all the time. I happen to think they're incorrect. Would it be fair to say that knowledge does not have to rely on science, but science has to rely on knowledge? I think that's fair. And um, uh, many of us, I, including myself, have a, a, a belief in our origin based on one man's testimony, mm -hmm. Moses. He, he is uh, a source of knowledge 
on origins, and where did he get that knowledge from? Was it through the scientific community of his time? Uh, it was given to him, and and we accept that knowledge as as truth based on the entire record of Scripture. And I like your thought about science in heaven. We will be told things, which is pretty much what what we have now. We have been told where we come from, and we either accept that or not. That's that's knowledge that that is true knowledge that um, science will. Science has a role in identifying how various aspects of that can work, but it's knowledge that's come to us outside of science. I yeah. guess is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, one more, uh, two more comments here. Go ahead. I think in practice, I love that quote that the gentleman had on his door. In theory, there is no different practice and practice there is. In practice, as we all have experienced it, and at least those of us who have uh, taken medicine, uh, perhaps PhDs experience it a little differently, but I'm speaking of it. Uh, from the direction that uh, those of us who are MDs and have taken it in this school, and I presume that it's quite similar to other medical schools too, um, the main reason that you call scientists and the main reason that you do experiments is to actually see that it works. You read about it in books, and uh, that's received knowledge, but somehow or another, it comes alive to you when you actually go into the laboratory, a physiology, physiology laboratory, have a smoke room, as we used in my day, and see that chronoxy is right. It does work that way. It, uh, a frog's leg does work that way when subjected to, to uh, electricity, mm -hmm. electrical stimulants. Mm -hmm. I also had the privilege of doing two years of research in a research lab um, of a more fundamental nature in which we did experiments to see <clears throat> whether an apo uh, a, a hypothesis was correct or not. Um, it's much like, I think, in this direction, in this way, science becomes an art. Uh, I am privileged to partake in both fields and both worlds, in uh, art and in painting and in science as it is experienced in a medical school. It's putting your hands on it. There are art critics who never do paintings, and they know all about how to handle color and so forth. But it somehow or another is very different when you sit at the easel yourself and try to do it. And uh, that's where science and art become soulmates and can be considered uh, one explains the other and not science as a science of origin. I don't think in heaven we're going to be too all interested in determining our origins, the science of origin, as we are in this class, and as we reviews, have reviewed various theories on origins, Darwin's and otherwise, we'll have that taken for granted. We're going to learn the details. Yeah. And the devil is in the details? No, God is. Anyway, one more comment and then we'll, we'll close, I think. I understand. Thank um, you. Um, thank you. You just made my comments. Uh, the thing that we left out of the discussion was just brought up. Uh, good science journals will not allow a paper to be published that is not described in such a way it can be gone back to and tested again. And that's out of the realm of possibility when you're looking at the past through present results. Which means that if you go back in the past, the term science is not... You're no longer using hard science. Yeah. And, and people in science know this. Well, they try to dodge it all the time. Uh, well, but it's true, and they know it. 
Uh, the evolutionary biologist is at the bottom of the pecking order. Jerry Coyne, evolutionary biologist. Anyway, um, next week we'll, uh, we'll have uh, chapter 25. It'll be interesting. Um, I've got to start it on realizing you can't compress this thing. <laughs>